of monoclonal gamma pathies, serum protein electrophoresis, immunofixation electrophoresis versus immunosubtraction electrophoresis and serum free light chain assay. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group. It is supported by Janssen and Nirvin and managed by Perfect Square. I thank Dr. Putia Dev, Mr. Ditesh Khanderwal and their team from Janssen, Mr. Paresh Prabhugaukar and their team from Nirvin, Mr. Yash, Mr. Kalpesh and the team from Perfect Square, Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, our chief guest today, Group Captain Dr. Harshit Purana from Pune, our guest speaker Dr. Barnali Das from Mumbai, all our discussants who are themselves eminent hematologists or hemato-oncologists or pathologists, you participants for sparing your Sunday morning, afternoon or evening. Coming Saturday, 10th June at 7 p.m. IST, we have Dr. Elena Gary. She's from Vancouver, Canada. She'll be speaking to us in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Next Sunday morning, 11th June, 11.30 a.m., Brigadian Tathagat Chatterjee will be speaking to, from Faridabad, Haryana, will be speaking to us on Mimickers of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Our discussions today have been put up here alphabetically. I'll briefly introduce them to you. We have Dr. Abhijit Baheti from Dinanath Mangeshikar Hospital, Pune. Dr. Amrita Saraf from Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi. Professor Javed Rasul from Shere Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences, Srinagar. Dr. Jyoti Bajaj Sane from GCRI Ahmedabad. Dr. Jyoti Kotwal from Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. Dr. Gayatri K from Tapadia Diagnostic Center, Hyderabad. Dr. M. I. Kadri from Clinical Lab, Srinagar. Dr. Mahadeva Swami from Manipal Hospital, Goa. Dr. Professor Naveen Kakka from Maharshi Markandeshwar Medical College and Hospital, Kumar Hatti Solan, Himanchal Pradesh. Dr. Parimal Sarda from Unipath, Ahmedabad. Dr. Rajat Jain from VMMC and Sattajang Hospital, Delhi. Dr. Renjit Matthew Vargis from Command Hospital, Pune. Dr. Shashi Bansal from Bhagwan Mahavir Cancer Hospital, Jaipur. Dr. Shruti Toshniwal Mantri from Shri V Care Clinic, Aurangabad. Dr. Siddhesh Kalantri from Blood Care Hematology Clinic, Nashik. Dr. Sumit Mir from Tata Memorial Center, Attract, Mumbai. Dr. Tushar Sehgal from Ames, Delhi. And Dr. Udyan Kachi from Udyan's lab, Vadodara. It's time to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Banali Das. She's MD, DNB, PGD, HHM, FF, FAACC. Lead consultant, biochemistry and immunology, lab medicine, at the prestigious Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital and Medical Research Center, Andheri, Mumbai. She is fellow American Association of Clinical Chemistry. She is chair American Association of Clinical Chemistry, Indian section. She is executive member, scientific division, International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Lab Medicine. NABL Assessor and College of American Pathologist Inspector. Reviews Editor, Practical Lab Medicine, Elsevier and Editor-in-Chief of AKI Special Issue, PLM. Editorial Board Member of many other journeys. Member and Advisory Panel, ICMR Task Force on Establishment of Reference Intervals in Indian Population. Adjunct faculty, KMC Manipal 
Manipal Academy of Higher Education. She's a recipient of three Oration Awards and several international and eight national awards. Recently, she has received Global Investigator Award in LMCE KSLM Lab Medicine Congress and Exhibition 2021 and 62nd Annual Meeting October 2021. She is recipient of 2021 the White Knight Award Healthcare Heroes of India by Metropolis Healthcare and Custodians of Humanity Award 2021 by IGHM for COVID Task Workforce. She has many research publications in international and national journals. Recent one like Clinical Chemistry, European Thyroid Journal, Clinical Biochemistry, Indian Heart Journal, IJCB and IJMB. As I said earlier, she will be lecturing on the harmonization of biomarker reports of monoclonal gammopathies, serum protein electrophoresis, immunofixation electrophoresis versus immunosubtraction electrophoresis and serum-free light chain assay. And now we come to our special guest, the chief guest of the day who is going to inaugurate our webinar. That's none other than Group Captain Dr. Harshit Rana. I'm grateful to him for sparing his morning to be with us to inaugurate and start this webinar. To introduce him very briefly, he's MBBS from AFMC Pune, MD Medicine from AHRR Delhi, DM in Clinical Hematology from PGI MER Chandigarh, PGD HHM, PGD MLS Symbiosis Pune. He's clinical hematologist, a bone marrow transplant physician, is professor of medicine and head of department geriatric medicine at the prestigious Armed Force Medical College Pune. He has been a very, very active hematologist and he has helped us by teaching our students and colleagues repeatedly in various congresses, meetings, seminars, and through webs. Uh, Dr. Harshit Khuran, I'm extremely grateful to you for being with us today. Please inaugurate our webinar and give us some words of wisdom for our colleagues, especially the students. Good morning, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. M.B. Agarwal, sir, for giving me this opportunity today to inspire the youngsters towards a brighter future in hematology. It is an honor to be addressing this August gathering today, sir. Uh, so as we all are well aware of uh, your zeal and energy in the relentless effort for organizing so many conferences and webinars to impart and enhance our knowledge in the field of hematology. Thank you so much, sir, for that. Uh, hematology, including both the diagnostic and the clinical practice, is probably one of the most rapidly evolving branches of medicine currently and is expanding in leaps and bounds. The approach to management of many hematological disorders has been revolutionizing at an exponential pace and is translating into remarkably improved outcomes of our patients, especially in the last decade or so. If I remember correctly, during my MD medicine days, the backbone treatment of myeloma used to be VAD chemotherapy. And to, in the current last decade or so, nobody has been talking about that aspect of the treatment. It, is, it has transformed to an extent that all the new regimens have come in, the newer treatments are coming in, the newer diagnostic modalities are coming in. And the prognosis at that point of time, uh, the, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, was to the tune of about three to four years on an average, which is now more than a, um, almost uh, touching a decade or so, especially for myeloma, if I say so. And all the other hematological diseases, especially the malignant disorders, there has been a remarkable transformation in the prognostic aspects of the, the, these diseases. So the challenges faced in our day-to-day -day practice are immense. With knowledge and experience, our knowledge towards these challenges continue to evolve. It also motivates us to never stop learning and asking what could be done better. So in this quest for progress and growth of knowledge in hematology, ongoing research is also imperative and which actually needs to be transformed into a multidisciplinary approach and customized management for each of our patients. There is a wide and expanding scope for the young physicians and pathologists to choose hematology as a future career prospect. This webinar organized today by SIR gives us all 
an, a platform for learning from the esteemed speaker on the subject and sharing our experiences. Lastly, one must always remember that medicine and hematology is an art as well as science practiced by us doctors who bring to bedside not only knowledge, the technology, techniques and training, but also humanity, care and concern for the patient. And to conclude, I would quote the great Einstein who said, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. And to take this journey in the quest for knowledge in hematology forward, I would now request M.B. Agarwal, sir, to take over and uh, give hand it over to the speaker further. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kurana, for those lovely words. Uh, you have been very kind to us, especially me. And you have been always there when it comes to education in the field of hematology. So it's always an honor <laughs> to be part of your teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you so and much. Now, of course, it's all over to Dr. Bernali Das for her great lecture that we are going to have. I recently had the opportunity of listening to her in Hotel ITC Grand Central Parel. Dr. Bernali, I was very impressed by your knowledge, the delivery, and the education skills that you have. So over to you now. It's all yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, thank you, MHG, Mumbai Hematology Group, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you, Dr. Kurana, for uh, uh, being the chief guest of this MHG seminar. So I'm really privileged that I am uh, in front of these esteemed delegates and with the pan panel of I have seen the expert discussant. So I'm really privileged and honored to be present here. And now I'll share my screen. The screen is visible. Yeah, just slide show mode. Yes. Perfect. Yes. So today my talk is uh, the harmonization of biomarker reports of monoclonal gammopathies. So daily in our lab life, we report uh, uh, monoclonal gammopathies. Sometimes we report M band, sometimes we report um, immunosubtraction by immunosubtractions or immunofixation. We see uh, we say that this is IgG kappa or IgA lambda. So, uh, but there is uh, the genesis of the talk is this. The genesis of the talk is this uh, when we report from lab. So, what clinic uh, like sir um, or or any clinical hematologist was they see from us and what they expect from us. So, uh, and how we should report and what should be our trend. So the genesis is the variation or uh, why the harmonization or uh, standardization is necessary. So how we are reporting, is it we are reporting, how, what is the gating of the method when we are describing our M band or monoclonal protein or para protein. So are we reporting by perpendicular method or what is the gating technique or corrected perpendicular or tangent scheming? So if you see the variation between these two of the same graph from tangent scheming is 10 gram per liter to perpendicular 15 gram per liter. So variation is quite uh, like 10 to 15 gram per liter. So what we should report or what is the method are we mentioning that in our report? Is it agarose gel electrophoresis or it is, or it is capillary zone electrophoresis? Are we sensitizing our uh, clinicians by which method we are reporting in our lab? So, or uh, is it immunofixation we are reporting or immunosubtraction we are reporting for uh, or immunotyping? So these are the variation of the method why we need the harmonization or standardization or genesis when Sar asked me for talk. So then I thought because seeing uh, those, um, seeing Sar as a uh, listener, or other esteemed delegates as a listener, I was really in dilemma. Should I uh, like have the capability to uh, uh, like deliver the lecture in front of you or not? But then I thought, because we uh, face those challenges every day, how should we report? So then I thought, let us discuss those challenges. So what 
should be the method of agarose gel electrophoresis or is it capillary zone electrophoresis? How we see in our lab and what clinicians see in report. So suppose this is the one report, how they have reported albumin, alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, total immunoglobulin. Uh, uh, if we are uh, measuring or quantity, uh, quantitation of immunoglobulins, immunoglobulin G, A, and M, then monoclonal band detected, and this is IgG kappa. So this is IgG kappa, what is the ground, uh, what is there in gram per liter? And the, if we are reporting first time report, so in the monoclonal, like the monoclonal IgG kappa is detected in the gamma region. So is there immunoparesis present or not? So this is very many times we don't report immunoparesis. So is there any uh, suppression of other immunoglobulins when IgG kappa we are seeing? So this is immunoparesis present or not? And when if it is coming patient coming for the second time, so uh, suppose in relapse or to monitor, so in the next report to report is there immunoparesis persist or how it is, uh, what is the, because of that, how we are uh, reporting, is it by tangent scheming or is it by perpendicular or corrected perpendicular, this becomes very important. So this is like different techniques. If we say this is uh, serum protein electrophoresis, what we see by um, agarose gel, and this is the immunofixation method, what we see. But coming to immunosubtraction, many lab now because of the faster or uh, or, uh, automated techniques shifted to the capillary zone electrophoresis, how the subtraction how, or how deletion we see in the lab. So this is uh, how we are reporting. So this is the genesis of the talk. So if we see this is our lab system, the patients are coming with burden of disease. And then we use our, as a biochemist, as a hematologist, uh, hematopathologist, or as a pathologist, we use our intelligence, discipline, and creativity. If we see like, you know, different kinds of reporting. So this is our creativity, like, you know, how to report, how should we include immunoparesis? Should we include uh, uh, all, all uh, like cumulative reporting or not? So this is uh, uh, very important. And then we see patients are going out with report and then you must be getting call uh, the Barnali, but you have reported that polyclonal band or increased gamma region or abnormal peak in the, uh, gamma or there is a beta gamma breeze. So this is not going with the clinical uh, manifestation. So you may be uh, getting, uh, we may be as a lab physician, we may be getting such kind of call, either patient or our clinicians are happy or maybe they are not satisfied. So because of that, and the third party is this, uh, like uh, we as a College of American Pathologist Inspector or NABLSSR, we go to some lab and we see the reporting pattern. And based on that, we see, oh, the lab seems to be very good. Their um, uh, immunofixation reporting or SPE reporting is very good. There is no deficiency or non non-compliance. So actually, if we see this cartoon is today's lab. So but for us, every blood sample tells us a story. Because of that, we realize there is need of harmonization or harmonized reporting of protein electrophoresis and uh, monoclonal gammopathy testing. So we proposed Asia Pacific Federation of Clinical Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine. We proposed a working scientific group so that we can harmonize the re uh, reporting pattern across Asia. So the overview of my today's talk is serum protein electrophoresis by agarose gel electrophoresis, then capillary zone electrophoresis, immunofixation or immunosubtractions. So what are those methods? If we write in our report that this we have done by capillary zone electrophoresis, what we should uh, convey to our clinicians. So because of that, I thought, uh, or if we report by immunofixation or immunosubtraction. So what are those challenges where we should not do immunosubtraction or immunotyping? Where 
higher the immunofixation give better results so because of that i i will give a little overview then diagnosis and monitoring of monoclonal gammopathies what information is useful to the clinician then serum protein electrophoresis interpretation and common patterns and then co-migrating monoclonal proteins so these are very important because many times we are very uh, happy to report monoclonal proteins but when there is a co-migrating monoclonal proteins we may miss or reporting of small bands if there is small bands many times we report thin discrete band but what does it mean to the clinicians and how we should report it so then uh, reporting of small bands and free free light chain why free light chain is important and the variation because nowadays we see uh, the variation in different methods because there are not uh, initially a few years back there is only one method available for free light chain now there are four or five different method of free light chain estimations and we see a lot of variation between method to method so what are those variation and well, what should we follow and uh, uh, if time permits i may discuss some case studies in our lab so this are uh, I don't need to uh, this. So this is actually uh, plasma cells are terminally differentiated B cells responsible for antibody secretion. But if uh, I, just for the completion sake, I'm uh, like telling this uh, slide. So uh, this is a clonal evolution of one or more plasma cell sets and the stage for development of plasma cell dyspraxia. So these are heterogeneous group of diseases characterized by expansion of number of the monoclonal bone marrow plasma cells that produce monoclonal immunoglobulins. And a WHO classification we have seen many times, WHO has given the classification non-IgM monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, multiple myeloma, small during non-secretory PCL, plasma cytoma, solitary plasma cytoma of bone, extra osseous, IgG, I, uh, sorry, immunoglobulin deposition disease like primary amyloidosis, AL amyloidosis, how we should report systemic light chain and heavy chain disease. Many times uh, we actually face because heavy chain disease are rare. So many times IgG4 disease, how to report IgG4 disease. So uh, like that, and then um, plasma cell neoplasm with paraneoplastic syndromes like POEMS and TEMP. So these are different types. So now there we have seen the M band. So it's monoclonal. Uh, we have written that M band or M protein, uh, monoclonal protein is positive. So the testing uh, for vital diagnosis, uh, where we know history and clinical examination, we should mention in our report imaging and then lab test. Uh, hematological test, CBC, differential and platelet count, chemistry, calcium, creatinine, done, electrolytes, LDH, ca uh, then calcium and albumin, uh, beta 2 microglobulin, then protein electrophoresis, agarose gel electrophoresis, capillary zone electrophoresis, serum immunofixation or immunosubtraction, we should mention in the method. Uh, we should mention in the report if there is benzoin immunofixation method, then serum free light chain and how to report that, and then bone marrow aspirate and bio, uh, biopsy, including bone marrow IHC, uh, IHC and immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry, cytogenetics, and fish. So these are the different kind, and uh, the asymptomatic is MGAS and smoldering multiple myeloma. Then um, now there is HR SMM. Uh, uh, 2018, then multiple myeloma, um, malignant, then how to differentiate between Walden's from macroglobulinemia and IgM. Uh, when we are reporting that solitary plasma cytoma, other lymphopolyphoretic syndrome, then if this is secondary, uh, we are seeing the polyclonal gammopathy. So is it due to some autoimmune disease, chronic infection, primary and secondary immunodeficiencies and um, some other lymphoid disease. So now the, 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 there are different guidelines. Lab group has given some guidelines. Clinical group have given different guidelines like international myeloma working group updated criteria for diagnosis of multiple myeloma. Then the consensus three statements. So, and then ESMO criteria. So there are different guidelines. So if we consider IMWG, um, International Myeloma Working Group criteria, usually uh, 
many of us in lab also we follow that so 2014 guidelines non igm mgas we uh, these are the different bone marrow plasma cell less than 10 percent monoclonal protein serum uh, less than 30 gram per liter or urine less than 500 milligram per 24 hour then if it is smaller in multiple myeloma serum more than equal to 30 gram per liter and you read more than equal to 500 milligram per 24 hour and uh, if there is a myeloma defining events then uh, this multiple myeloma so these are evidence of end organ damage uh, crap criteria and biomarkers of malignancy clonal bone marrow plasma cells more than equal to 60 percent involved and uninvolved um, uh, serum free light chain ratio more than equal to 100 or more than one focal lesions of mri studies so why these are important for lab people also because many times we uh, don't report like for example, we report the FLC ratio, we report kappa lambda ratio. Many of us don't report as a involved and uninvolved light chain, free light chain ratio. And what is the involved fraction? What is the uninvolved fractions? How uh, important that is for the uh, my, um, uh, this myeloma defining events. So because of that, uh, this is very much important. So yeah, for this, the crab titradia or the presence of protein related organ or tissue impair impairment. So the anemia, uh, so these are the different criteria is hypercalcemia and renal insufficiency. How we are reporting, are we reporting EGFR or not along with the uh, creatinine, then serum creatinine more than two milligram per deciliters or bone lesions one or more osteolytic lesions on skeletal radiography, MRI, CT, or PET CT. So these are slim criteria of uh, MM defining biomarkers, my, uh, myeloma defining, greater than and equal to 60% of the clonal plasma cells of bone marrow, then involved and uninvolved free light chain ratio of 100 or more than, uh, more with the involved free light chain being greater than or equal to um, 100 milligram per liter. So this is very important for us in this slim criteria. We still report as a kappa lambda ratio, but uh, let us start reporting involved and uninvolved free light chain ratio and what is the method. So that is very important. When we report many times, we don't report because we expect the clinician will send the sample only to our lab. So this is many times not possible. Patient may be coming, uh, coming from different part of the world. So they may go to another uh, country or another location. So maybe what um, we are doing free light chain by a binding site, someone is doing the free light chain by Siemens or someone is doing by RAW or someone is doing by CBR. So if Eliza, so um, based on that, what we are reporting the free light chain ratio, that's very important. And because of that, this involved and uninvolved free light chain ratio, to report it in ratio is very much important and to give the reference interval and to write which instrument we are using and which method we are using for free light chain is very much important. So uh, why these are important, like uh, when we see this uh, uh, IMWG criteria for um, the response, like stringent complete response, uh, where uh, there is a complete response plus serum free light chain ratio. Many times we don't feel that free light chain is important. When we see the, uh, we when we are reporting multiple myeloma report, uh, so it's better to see the complete picture for the left physician too. So uh, uh, is it stringent uh, complete response or complete response, uh, serum electrophoresis or urine immunofixation electrophoresis, why this is important? So serum and urine. So uh, and then the very good partial response um, by only detectable by IFE. So these are different criteria for partial response, minimal response, uh, be, very good partial response. So because of that, all those tests which we are reporting, uh, either serum electrophoresis or uh, serum immunofixation or subtraction, although this criteria doesn't mention about subtraction, still um, uh, there is immunofixation. Uh, the criteria is uh, gold standard and mentioned here. 
So, but with time, um, it will come that immunofixation or immunosubtraction method in the response criteria and then the quantitative immunoglobulin levels. Quantitative immunoglobulin levels, are we quantitating other immunoglobulins, IG, immunoglobulins A, uh, immunoglobulins G and M by nephilometry, or we are I I I reporting by immunotabidimetry? So this methods and reference interval and cutoff very much important to report in our uh, lab report. So these are uh, updated IMWG criteria for diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So this is uh, the MGAS what, and smoldering myeloma. So this already I have seen. So now coming to serum protein electrophoresis. So as we all know, electrophoresis is a broad term that refers to separation of charged particles in liquid medium under the influence of electric field. So electrophoretic migration is dependent on the size, shape, net charge of the molecule, as well as the properties of the electrophoretic system. So the, there are two types. One is the gel electrophoresis and one, one is a capillary zone electrophoresis. One is agarose gel, which commonly we see in our medical college lab, commonly we see in, yeah, in our lab. So that is agarose gel electrophoresis. But now for faster turnaround time and for automated reporting, many people have has shifted to the capillary zone electrophoresis. So what are the advantages of gel electrophoresis and capillary zone electrophoresis? I will describe it. Then primary role of serum protein electrophoresis to detect the monoclonal proteins and associated with plasma cell dyscrasias and lymphoproliferative disorders. And serum protein electrophoresis may also reflect other clinical conditions like acute and chronic inflammations, nephrotic syndrome, if there is alpha-2 increase, or alpha-1, uh, if there is alpha-1, we don't see any slope, there is a decrease in alpha-1 so the region, so alpha-1 entities in deficiency or not, although very rare. So these are different information we get from that. So gel electrophoresis is one of the most common electrophoretic technique performed by applying a sample to gel support and separating the protein. And um, so there is uh, this electric field causes a flow of ions between the different nodes. So gel electrophoresis consists of support media like agarose gel, then cellulose acetate, polyacrylamide gels of various pore size. Agarose gel is a common support media in most of the clinical lab. lab. The buffer is 8.6, resulting most protein having overall negative charge. And detection of protein is accomplished through visualization using stains like a CBB or amido black. So features, support media, what support media we are using, what is a uh, visualizing stains and densitometry. So basically the principle is migration of charged particles in gel to a fluid under the influence of electric field. And uh, coming to the capillary gel, elect gel electrophoresis. So this is the separation technique where this is performed in a capillary tube with the application of the high voltage. So this uh, actually consists of high voltage power supply, sample introduction to system, capillary tube, and output device. So capillary tubes are usually composed of few silica or with an internal diameter of 20 to 100 micrometer and few silica contain silanol groups and that becomes ionized in an alkaline buffer creating an electric double layer producing a flow of buffer towards the cathode. So basically the movement of proteins with the flow of the buffer with, uh, which is due to electroosmotic force. So this is uh, the diagram for capillary electrophoresis where there is electro endosmotic flow and this is the principle and why many people choose that because of the faster turnaround time and there is uh, this is fully automated so because of that many lab shifted to from agarose gel electrophoresis shifted to the capillary electrophoresis 
So now coming to monoclonal gamma pathways, these are group of disorders already I have seen. And um, so we can uh, diagnose by CDA protein electrophoresis, urinary protein electrophoresis, IFE, immunofixation or immunosubtraction and CDA free light chain. And um, also if there is uh, AL amyloidosis, wellness from macroglobulinemia. So then uh, beyond the routine lab testings, there are available availability of uh, anti-sera and also uh, like serum free light chain helps in diagnosis of AL amyloidosis and uh, we should have strict cutoffs for diagnosis and monitoring either we should report in absolute value like gram per liter or we should say the percentage chain or immunoparesis. So what we see in lab so this is like agarose gel electrophoresis. We see this band and we happily report this is M protein and we report like this, we get the report like this. Or uh, this is the immunofixation. So there we see this is uh, IgG, lambda. So like that report. And this is capillary electrophoresis. We get the report like this. And um, for serum protein electrophoresis and this for immunosubtraction. So so in immunosubtraction, we get the report like this, and this are subjective of interpretation. We report, uh, so if, if in this case, if you see the deletion of subtraction, this is IgG, and if you see in the kappa, so this is IgG kappa. So, and uh, what goes to the clinicians, so, uh, if they ask for the quantitation, so we give the value uh, of IgG, then uh, this is serum FLC kappa here, this involved uninvolved ratio is uh, here around 500, and then beta 2 microglobulin is raised for these patients. So this is goes to this goes to the clinicians. So clinicians is that. So because of that, our responsibility is to mention what technique we are using to give the report of serum free light chain with involved and uninvolved criteria because clean criteria consist of that, and also what method or what instrument we are reporting and how we are reporting that and if there is a you know, paresis. So if suppose serum protein electrophoresis, what should be the content? So is there a monoclonal protein, the isotype and concentration, location of the monoclonal protein? Is it in the gamma region? Is it in the beta region? Because we have seen IgA, we see in the beta region. And if the monoclonal protein in beta or alpha region, sometimes we see in alpha region monoclonal protein. So many a times we see the overlapping with the normal proteins. And so then comes the quantitation, quantifications of the immunoglobulins are important. So a comment about the therapy because of that history taking or clinical examinations are important. Is it the uh, previous patients? How previously we have seen the monoclonal protein what was the difference between is immunoparesis persisting or not? Then cumulative reporting to monitor the progression of the disease or relapse to calculate the response of the therapy and other information related to monitoring like negative um, immunofixation or if it is an oligoclonal band and small band that occur post-transplant or post-monoclonal antibody therapy or if there is a mono, uh, immunoparesis. So that, uh, like we know with the post-monoclonal antibody therapy, if we are reporting by um, capillary zone electrophoresis or by agarose gel electrophoresis. So there are many times we see the interferences. So because of the interferences also, we, uh, the inter, uh, to look at the interferences are very important. And the consistent reporting, the pattern which we are reporting today, we should report the same pattern in our next reporting also for the same patients or cumulative reporting. So uh, the basics, know the basics related to the, for us actually basically related to the serum protein electrophoresis and the clinical requirements, normal proteins in different zone, causes of increase or decrease zones and unusual shape of any fraction or zone. Sometimes we see albumin slurry. So what is the reason for albumin slurry? Or sometimes we see the antibiotics interferences. So which zone is will affect? So I didn't 
identification of abnormal fraction or peak, then possible interferences like hemolysis, fibrinogen, heparin effect, drug binding effect, radio contrast, dye effect, or antibiotic effects in capillary zone electrophoresis, then clinical requirements, criteria to diagnosis and monitoring of monoclonal gammopathy, and use all the information available to you, like age, clinical presentation, history, and other test results like history recently on IgG4 disease, the history became so important for the diagnosis of IgG4. So, um, so other tests, right? because otherwise uh, clinician may not ask for IgG4 in that patient. So because of that, if we, there are very much responsibility of us lab physician. So other test results like hemoglobin, creatinine, EGFR, calcium serum, free light chain, and if repeat serum protein electrophoresis, check for the previous uh, report for the comparison. And when we encounter any unusual pattern, so we should contact the clinicians because many times I contact our clinical hematologists or I ask our hematology, hematopathologists like, is can it be IgD myeloma? Should we uh, like treat with the IgD antisera? IgD or IgE. So uh, should we run the IgD or anti IgE antisera in agarose gel electrophoresis to check if it is IgD myeloma? Because many times we may be reporting light chain disease, but it may be IgD or IgE. So if there is any unusual pattern, so to contact the clinician and correlate uh, findings with the clinical question being asked. And so like I said, uh, there are uh, clinical criteria. Similarly, there are lab criteria too. So the recommendation of different groups like Australia, New Zealand, and international guidelines, uh, different guidelines. Cal College of American Pathologists recently gave one guidelines along with ASCC and uh, American Society of Clinical Pathology. So there are different guidelines. And so this is the recent guidelines given for lab detection and initial diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathy. So, uh, so coming to the immunoglobulins, why immunoglobulin molecules is composed, composed of two identical heavy chains to identical light chains. So G, A, M, D, E. So uh, G, A, M, we can detect by immunofixation. We can detect by immunosubtraction. But many times when it comes to D and E, many times we, are, uh, we report as a light chain disease. And two identical light chains like kappa and lambda, heavy chains are such paired with a single light by the disulfide bridge or non covalent interaction to form the heavy light chain pair. Two heavy light chain pairs are linked by disulfide bond in the hinge region to form a Y-shaped molecules. So this Y-shaped molecule is very important and normal production of the free light chain is 40% higher of the heavy chains to achieve correct assembly. So non-incorporated or no, uh, like, you know, whichever is free or non-bound. Uh, non so this non-incorporated light chains are released into the blood as free light chain. So we used to report as a light chain or in immunofixation electrophoresis or immunosubtraction, we get the light chain. Mainly we, uh, if we are not um, doing the special treatment of in, uh, uh, like free light chain entry sera. So we usually get, get kappa and lambda light chain, not free light chain. So what we quantify in serum, that is the free light chain. So for us to report properly is also important. So these are different like five classes of IgG, IgA is dimer, IgM is pentamer, IgD and again uh, this is Y then IgE. So this these are so different ten combination can happen for uh, ten, uh, heavy and light chain and. So these are the, uh, usually we see in the normal plasma cells, the normal polyclonal immunoglobulins. But when there is a malignant plasma cell, we see uh, this M-band or monoclonal uh, protein. So these different zones are very important. Like if there is a beta region, so if we are suspecting IgA myeloma, so it, it will come in the beta region. And gamma region, IgG and IgM, we see. So, and different other 
interference is when if there is alpha two increase, so it may be haptoglobin, cerebroplasmin, alpha two macroglobin. So their acute phase reaction, and uh, so dif different zone. What are the proteins? present so these are very important and what are the many other associated disorders like cirrhosis beta gamma bridge we saw in patients so that may be due to cirrhosis so to see is the beta gamma bridge what is the reason for this beta gamma bridge is it some para protein and the mono monoclonal protein which is giving beta gamma bridge or is it due to cirrhosis so this the different um, this is very important to know uh, like you know what are the uh, indications or what are the clinical um, presentation. So now, uh, like, you know, identification of monoclonal bands by SP, then gel-based immunofixation or capillary electrophoresis-based immunos abstraction. So the first presentation, if we see abnormal band or peak is observed or suspected, an abnormal electrophoretic curve, isolated hypogamma globulinemia, clinical and other lab findings, then so we should query, is it monoclonal gammopathy? So if there is CRAP criteria, so other a test we should do. Uh, so if immunofixation or immunosubtraction is performed or not. Suppose this is subsequent presentation, so cumulative reporting and patients with previous monoclonal band, if there is a change in the electrophoretic mobility or previously reported monoclonal uh, protein is no longer visible or appearance of the new band, then we need another, immuno, another time immunofixation. Otherwise, we don't need serum protein electrophoresis is sufficient. We do don't need for the second time. So if there is appearance patients with previous uh, monoclonal band, the appearance of new band or change in the clinical condition. So how we see this is normal, the first one, and this is the monoclonal immunoglobulin. And this is the polyclonal. Many times we re in, uh, report that polyclonal gammopathy or increase in the polyclonal immunoglobulins. We see this rounded drop with large basement. So why this is important? Quantification and reporting of monoclonal protein. So we which we are reporting in our lab. So is it perpendicular like this past Genesis slide? We I said, is it perpendicular or it is target, corrected perpendicular or we are doing valley to valley tangent scheming? So it's very important how we are reporting in our lab. Or suppose my uh, the patient has gone from our lab to another lab, how they have to see the graph, why this is important to know this, how they have reported. Is it because many times we see 15 gram per liter or 10 gram per liter, it really doesn't mean anything. So because of that, to see how is the picture of the serum protein electrophoresis, this is very important. So is there uh, in the absence of reference method to know the exact peak concentration is many time difficult to determine the accuracy of the gating methods. So these gating methods are very important for us. So why? So like this, is, there is a multi-central study it's published in CCLM journal. So uh, using daratumumab, IgG, kappa monoclonal proteins showed the differences between the perpendicular drop and tangent scheming. If you see the differences in different method, if you see uh, there are variation in our differences uh, with uh, daratumumab, IgG, kappa monoclonal proteins. So the differences were more prominent in hypergamma globulin anemia and very low concentration of monoclonal proteins less than 10 gram per liter. So this study suggests that although the measurement of monoclonal protein is overestimated with perpendicular dropping and underestimated with tangent scheming, but we should follow the same trend. We, if we, our lab we are doing by perpendicular dropping, let us do by perpendicular dropping. If the second lab is doing by tangent scheming, let them follow the same trend. So because of that, it's very very important to use whatever you are using for monitoring. We should use the same method or same lab. So this is uh, like both serum and urine should be assessed. Uh, so this is uh, the criteria uh, for monoclonal protein. So this, uh, I don't know how much uh, is followed, but these are uh, agarose gel electrophoresis or capillary zone electrophoresis of serum and urine is preferred to screen for the presence of monoclonal protein. But usually we see the serum uh, electrophoresis uh, mainly for screening. 
So this is lab test for multiple myeloma, different lab tests, 24 hour urine uh, routine analysis, or sometimes Ben's Jones protein if it is suspected. So this we, to, we send for the 24 hour urine collection for electrophoresis and immunofixation along with serum protein electrophoresis and serum protein immunofixation. The patient with measurable monoclonal protein in serum and electrophoretic measurements to follow the monoclonal protein are preferred. And for patients with non-secretory or oligosecretory myeloma, the free light chain should be serially assessed. So for that non-secretory and oligosecretory myeloma, the free light chain, serum free light chain measurements are important. So screening is basically SPE. And then uh, if there is no clinical suspicion, so stop. If there is M spike or clinical suspicion, so then we should do all those tests for and for monitoring SPE or urinary protein electrophoresis and for light chain amyloidosis, oligosecretory myeloma, non-secretory myeloma, disease not measurable by SPE or urinary protein electrophoresis, but there is a clinical suspicion, then we should do serum free light chain. And 2013, this is the IG, IMWG recommendation and there is not much change. And these are uh, like, you know, serum protein, urine electrophoresis and nephilometer uh, nephilometry for serum immunoglobulins baseline and follow up. So here also important because serum immunoglobulins can be measured by nephilometer also can be measured by immunotabidimetry also. So because of that method is important and cutoff or reference interval is important. We started one reference interval ICMR um, reference interval to define the reference interval for Indian population. So there are, we realize that how much difference some of us are reporting the uh, take the guidelines from Europe, take the guidelines from US. So because of that, Asia Pacific or Indian reference at, or cutoff is may, very much important for all the tests and uh, our reporting pattern or in-house reporting pattern. So the immunofixation electrophoresis and then free light chain, again, the methods are very important. So this is European Society for Medical Oncology 2017. So they have said that urine analysis is part of multiple myeloma diagnosis. So this M protein, heavy chain, G-A-M-D-E, light chain, kappa, lambda, immunofixation or immunosubtraction. So both method, uh, what is the difference between immunofixation and immunosubtraction by both method, we get monoclonal immunoglobulin present and immunofixation. There is a gel simple uh, signal amplification and immunosubtraction liquid medium, and there is a subtraction. So the principle of immunofixation, the sample is applied um, six times at different concentration using the immunofixation program. So there is migration, then anti sera applications, then blotting to remove the unprecipitated proteins, then washing and staining. So these are the different immunofixation. This is how normal look like, normal immunofixation. So this is absolutely normal. So, and this is IgG lambda. And then uh, for how polyclonal increase, how we see in the polyclonal increase in IgG and the Gaussian curve, then free light chain, this is lambda and this is kappa and uh, free light chain and how we see by immunofixation. So free light chain, mm, many times if we are suspecting IgD and IgE, because free light chain suspicions we see uh, and we give the, this as a free light chain. But many times we need to talk to the clinician, is it IgD or IgE? Because then A, M and um, G, we will not see any pattern. So then there is requirement of anti IgD anti sera and anti IgE anti sera or quantification of that. So because of that, and this is done in agarosial electrophoresis. So immunosubtraction, if we see, there is a subtraction of antigen of interest with complementary antibody. So in this, this uh, if we see, there is a deletion or subtraction. So how we see that? So this is monoclonal peak and this is G. And if you see, this is G, there is a deletion. If you see, this is deletion. And so, and if we see lambda, there is a deletion. So this is IgG lambda. Presence of IgG lambda. So this is 
the normal how we should report because many times we could get confused if it is the two third kappa one third lambda how we should report we should we report kappa or lambda or not so because there are a lot of subjectivity in this so for this is polyclonal this is monoclonal so there is a complete subtraction and or there is partial subtraction so this is complete subtraction and so the difference between that uh, immunofixation, there are low, lower resolution and also there are higher resolution that amplification of the signal happens in immunofixation and immunosubtraction and, uh, happens in capillary gel electrophoresis and there is a deletion or subtraction. So easier interpretation of closely migrating F proteins or of oligoclonal patterns, but immunofixation many times higher sensitivity detection of faint bands, including those invisible on serum protein electrophoresis, unless these faint bands are IgG, in this case, the sensitivity of immunosubtraction uh, will be higher. So because of that, there are challenges of immunosubtraction and there are advantages of uh, immunosubtraction or immunotyping. So these are faster, these are automated and immuno fixations, these are manual and also, uh, but for some faint band or oligoclonal IgG, um, immunosubtraction may be uh, superior and, uh, but usually we prefer uh, most of the times immunofixation and most of the labs we do immunofixation. So let us see co-migrating monoclonal protein. So quantification of monoclonal proteins migrating in the non-gamma region, alpha or beta is challenging. In the beta region, this may be obscured by varying concentration of C3 complement or transferins or mainly affects IgA monoclonal proteins greater than 40% of which migrate in the beta region, but up to 25% of all paraproteins may migrate in the beta region or gamma region. So if we see IgA, so it we usually we see in the beta region. So both densitometric monoclonal proteins and immunochemical total immunoglobulin measurements have limitation. In this case, densitometry measures both the monoclonal proteins and co-migrating proteins. So many times we are over-reporting in this case. So immunochemical methods is important by reporting the immunoglobulins by the quantifications. So uh, this co-migrating protein, there is a significant uh, between the laboratory variation and reported in the monoclonal protein concentration, difference between method like C uh, capillary zone and agarose gel electrophoresis. So what we are reporting, difference between lab practices, are we reporting total beta and monoclonal protein? Are we reporting total beta or beta two, beta one, beta two and monoclonal protein or total immunoglobulin concentration, globulin E. Let's see the, how, what is the difference because otherwise we'll not understand. So if this is capillary zone beta one and this is agarose gel electrophoresis, see the difference between variation uh, between perpendicular and corrected perpendicular and tangent scheming. So this variation, this is the sample from uh, New Zealand and this is the RCPA uh, quality, external quality assessment survey. So if you see what, how we are reporting, is it total beta plus para protein? Are we reporting beta two plus para protein? Are we reporting corrected perpendicular or are we reporting tangent skimming? So if we see tangent skimming is six gram per liter and if total beta plus para protein is 16 gram per liter. So how much difference we see? So because of that, for co-migrating monoclonal protein, there is recommendation and clinical guidelines recommendation. And for IgA and IgD myelomas, quantitative immunoglobulin measurements are pre preferred for disease assessment. The same percentage changes apply as for the serum M spike because of this co-migrating monoclonal proteins. So these are the different reporting patterns and uh, like how we should first report and how we should report as a cumulative patterns. So uh, then 
if there is a small band. So therapeutic monoclonal antibodies have immune modulatory effects and are postulated to act in part by increasing antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. So we have seen daratumumab and elotizumab has Im human immunoglobulin G1 that binds with CD38. So because of that, many times we see therapeutic IgG kappa monoclonal antibody. So uh, there are interferences due to that. If you see, these are healthy volunteers. These are different monoclonal antibody treatments. How we are seeing? So there are IgG kappa uh, pattern with this monoclonal antibodies. So this is before daratumumab therapy, and this is during daratumumab therapy. So these are different uh, diagrams. So whenever we are seeing some small band, so new small abnormal band with different electrophoretic mobility from original paraprotein in a patient with known paraprotein. So the first presentation of small abnormal band or no known paraprotein. So there are different kinds of reporting for both those patterns. So uh, this already I have said, like, you know, how we should uh, quantify the monoclonal IgM. So accurate determination of monoclonal IgM concentration is important to patient uh, to differentiate between Waldeck's from macroglobulinema. So current laboratory methods, measurement of monoclonal IgM using protein electrophoresis, measurement of total IgM by immunochemical methods, like when may, many a times is uh, serum electrophoresis is unreliable. So uh, doing by nephilometry or uh, immunotropetimetry is important and serial numbering should be done using the same method. So whatever we are doing, immunotropetimetry, nephilometry, or serum protein electrophoresis or immunofixation, we should write about that method. So these are different problems. So uh, by IgM, monoclonal uh, band reporting. So because of that, how to minimize those artifacts? So treatment with the beta marker channel, BME or DTT is important. So see this, how we see that IgM. So I, this is IgM kappa, but how we first uh, visualize this as uh, all bands are pre present in all the um, uh, like G, A, M, kappa, lambda. What should we report? Then after treatment with BME or fluidyl, so we saw the IgM kappa. So this is one um, publication how they showed like uh, capillary zone electrophoresis and immunofixation scan without BME. So we can't report that. We are missing the band uh, in capillary zone electrophoresis. And after BME uh, treatment, uh, we see this band in capillary zone and immunofixation. So because of that, these are many times important. These are different heavy chain disease. So many times we report broad IgG peak in the gamma region. So what uh, does it broad follicular peak in the beta gamma region? Is it due to... Um, Cirrhosis, or is it due to uh, IgG4 disease? So that becomes very important. So this we know IgG4 related disease. Also, we see this beta gamma region P, and uh, this is uh, the management and diagnosis. How we should do? We should do serum levels of IgG4, and uh, this is IgG4 related disease where we see the broad band in the beta gamma region, and this is a monoclonal protein. So because of that we should be very cautious and now the serum free light chain uh, like we many uh, we report as a like you know production ratio to is to one but here we should report involved and uninvolved ratio because now it suggests that we should report involved and uninvolved uh, ratio more than equal to 100 or involved free light chain more than equal to 100 so, and uh, how we, uh, the difference in reduction, why this is important because of the complete response or VGPR or progressive disease. So difference in free light chain uh, is important. And ALM amyloidosis, this is, the, this is the guidelines how we should report that. So what do we mean by that? So this is one report. So this is the kappa lambda ratio. If we see, this is, 0.02 and involved is lambda 
here uh, 250 and uninvolved is kappa. Involved and uninvolved serum free light chain ratio here is 50. And difference is involved FLC minus uninvolved FLC. So here is 245. So we should report like um, the difference also and also the ratio. So now the challenges. The challenges is there are different assays. One is like binding site. Most of the labs, Indian lab, we use binding site free light assay. So this is, if you see the cutoff or reference values for binding sites, this is Siemens assay. The reference values for Siemens, then Cedarlite has, then Sevilla has, ELISA. So these are the reference values. And the, if you see the antibodies here, the polyclonal, some are monoclonal. So antibodies are also different. So because of that, the limitation of serum-free light chain, a lot to lot vari variations and underestimation due to antigen excess or low affinity for certain monoclonal free light chain or overestimation due to interferences or reactivity to polymeric uh, free light chains. And also their non-linearity, the dilution is really challenging. Uh, for us. So if we see the um, their un involved and uninvolved ratio, there are difference between uh, like concordance, there are a lot of difference between different uh, method or different instrument. Usually in the lower concentration, this is more or less same or more than thousand in higher concentration, you can see the variation. You can see the variation between various with different instruments. So these are so we should not directly compare results from different essay. It's important to state the method on the report and the unique kappa lambda, kappa lambda ratio, reference interval, then involved, uninvolved ratio, we should report. So this is like normal, how we report. This is also, we should be uh, careful when you are reporting like 0 0.0, uh, 0.02, or if it is high, then we should be careful. Uh, and uh, so because of that, there is a higher sensitivity of uh, serum free kappa and lambda ratio. So this is again different interferences. I already suggest uh, say like fibrinogen contrast dye, heterophilic antibodies, and these are the action for resolutions for some immunofixation electrophoresis. They are unaffected for some uh, monoclonal therapies. We see both. Uh, so because of that, uh, many times uh, we need to be careful when the patient on monoclonal therapies. So daratumumab, we I have already said this is before daratumumab and this is after daratumumab. So this is again new criteria of HR. It's high risk smoldering multiple myeloma in given in 2018. So different. Uh, so we should know the different criteria. We should know how to report. And this is the CAP international guidelines, more or less same what I have seen. So this is one case. Uh, 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 to show this is the challenge. How should I report? So I saw this biclonal gamopathy and should I was a little bit scared to report because why should, how should we report? Uh, should we report like, you know, the uh, whole with paraprotein, the total thing, or should we report M1 spike, M2 spike and uh, immunotyping showed both bands were in IgG lambda. So this is also, I um, mean, and with this patient, uh, if we see this is 79 year old female with history of beta thalassemia minor, admitted with severe fatigue, uh, had previous blood transfusions, elevated total protein, anemia, calcium, serum creatinine was reference range, serum protein electrophoresis so showed biclonal gamopathy. And these are the different uh, report where we saw the serum free lambda is uh, very high in this patient, IgG very high. So pet, these are the PET, PET scan report and this is uh, different CD markers um, and uh, by bone marrow biopsy suggested or multiple myeloma. So this is one like how um, even I'm not sure about how should we report by perpendicular drop or should we report the individual or paraprotein. So actually the people suggest to, we should report by paraprotein and the uh, monoclonal by both uh, also.
So there are some suggestions. So this is uh, normal IgG kappa, how uh, we see. And this is another peak case uh, where we have seen uh, there is broad peak. So in this broad peak, IgG is present. And uh, these are different values like how IgG and this is serum free kappa and serum free lambda chain. And this is the ratio. And um, this is the beta one wide band. Uh, in the beta region, there is a wide band. So this is IgA kappa. So if we see in IgA region, there is a deletion. And this is in kappa region, there is a complete deletion. So this is IgA kappa. So because of that, we should be very careful about the interferences due to monoclonal antibody therapy when we are reporting. So uh, there are several mass spec based methods to detect monoclonal antibody therapy, newer, but I don't know in India anybody is doing that, but they, this is available, you know, mass spec based methods. So I want to finish with this. Uh, this is my painting. So yes, you are the healer, the clinical immunologist like Sir and many of you. So you are the healer and who are treating the patients. But um, in my painting, if you see this extended head, that is ours. We lab physicians, we diagnosticians, we biochemists, hematopathologists, uh, then the, we um, pathologists, we actually help you to heal. So because of that, our knowledge is also many times very important updating our knowledge. So this is my acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernali. Of course, you are so important for everybody to make a diagnosis, follow up, assess the response. Beautiful talk. I enjoyed listening to you. Uh, Thank you. I want to ask our discussants to use the raise hand sign to ask you questions. One comment has been put by uh, Dr. Amrita in the chat box. Uh, she says, to my knowledge, it is always good to include flow cytometry. Absolutely. To the clonality of the plasma cell and lymphocytes, if possible, while investigating a monoclonal gammopathy. Absolutely, absolutely. The, uh, in reporting, that's the major thing. Like I showed how we report one case of biclonal gammopathy. Absolutely. Right. Dr. Jyoti, go ahead with your question. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Bernali, very nice and informative talk. Uh, since uh, immunosubtraction and immunofixation both have their advantages, should a lab have both these methods for uh, uh, immunophenotyping? Uh, I don't think that is uh, like, you know, uh, very cost effective, like uh, to have both immunofixation and immunosubtraction, because uh, always we know so who are doing the immunosubtraction uh, or who are doing by immunofixation. So whatever method you have, if you have immunofixation, so when there is, you feel like, you know, challenges like uh, the oligo, like oligoclonal band. So you, you see that by maybe immunofixation, you are not picking up, you want to know. So then for those, you can go for immunosubtraction. Similarly, those who are doing immunosubtractions to report some of the uh, like um, small band or co-migrating. So to go with the immunofixation so that it advantages. So we then for one or two samples, we can always outsource. But having the both the methods, if of course we have the, like, you know, uh, if it is, uh, we are having some research facility if we want to have both is fine but again you don't know like you know how many cases you are giving for immunosubtraction or how many cases you giving for the immunofixation so we better to outsource one or two patients rather than having both the method another uh, what are what uh, method are you doing for serum free light chain ratio what method is your lab using Nephilometry. So this is uh, nephilometry by the binding site. But again, I, I, I they have seen uh, like those who are doing by Siemens analyzers or by others like new because these all are binding scientists since long. Like, you know, 10 to LBRs, the binding site free light chain when it was there. Because of that, most of the lab must be doing binding site. But now this has the new entrance like CBR, ELISA, and then the Siemens. So they have polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. So people have seen the 
like you know harmonization with uh, it's not that today i have done with binding sign tomorrow if i do with the cea or uh, siemens so that will be different but following the same trend so that is advantageous any any instrument both uh, all are uh, like fda approved thank, thank you thank you dr chuti one question from the chat box dr kanan wants to know what is meant by oligoclonal band oligoclonal band is when we see an amino fixation or several bands say so multiple peaks in the gamma region or multiple peaks in the beta and gamma region so then we uh, report that as a oligoclonal band and then this is by sedum protein in uh, electrophoresis we see multiple small peaks i think i have also that picture with me so and um, if i can share can can i share sir again yes, sir okay Sorry, I I don't have. Uh, but there are actually multiple peaks. What we see, uh, in oligoclonal band, uh, protein syndrome, hyperglycemia. No, I can. I, I yes, yes, oligoclonal profile. So if you can see, this is the oligoclonal profile. So this is, if you see the band in the, the uh, this is biclonal, and uh, where IgA kappa and uh, lambda IgA kappa Ig uh, G lambda. So this is biclonal gammopathy, and uh, this is IgM kappa IgM lambda. So now let me go to the oligoclonal. So oligoclonal uh, profile, we see uh, like uh, the autoimmune diseases and also viral and bacterial parasites and congenital immunodeficiency. So exactly this kind of uh, band, if you see the G region multiple band. And then uh, kappa and lambda, there are multiple pr presence of multiple faint and narrow band generated by synthesis of some immunoglobulin subclasses. So this is called oligoclonal band. Thank you, uh, Professor Navin Kakkar. Your question. Yeah, so excellent talk, excellent talk, Doctor Banali. Uh, my question is: a lot of labs, even Banali in medical college, stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, Dr. Banali, uh, a lot of labs, even in medical colleges, do not offer these assays, the complex assays. So samples are transported to central labs. So are there any pre-analytical variables that uh, clinicians need to be taking care of while interpreting reports from such long transport areas? Yes, sir. Sir, a lot of time, many times we have seen even serum and plasma, we have seen a lot of variation due to fibrinogen and all. So uh, when we are transporting, the cold chain should be maintained. And many times, if we are not suspecting something, if there is some uh, like, you know, abnormal pattern is reported, so we should be very careful. And another request, if possible, because nowadays this is not manual all the like you know immunofixation or um, this immunosubtraction immunotyping so these are very fast so if we can have that and that doesn't require also very uh, like uh, knowledge very much knowledge to report so to start reporting so if we can have uh, start uh, having any uh, like you know capillaries that uh, electrophoresis which is by uh, for uh, serum protein electrophoresis and immunosubtraction. So they're completely automated. So we can start that. And even agarose gels, there are uh, manual gel also used to be like, you know, 
uh, we used to do in during our medical college day, days. So now this is more or less automated. So we should uh, start doing that. But if we are outsourcing that, we should be very careful that if there is some abnormal pattern to recheck that or talking to the lab physician is very important because many a times we miss or many in la many labs actually we do, we miss reporting many things we think that everyone should uh, are aware about these methods this technique and we don't report like immunoparesis i don't think anybody is reporting immunoparesis so similarly so there are uh, different uh, it's always better uh, to talk to the lab physician with the clinicians and even clinician with the lab physician if there is some abnormal band the lab is reporting. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Sumit, your question. Good morning. Thank you for your excellent talk. I'm audible, sir. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. So at times when myeloma is diagnosed, they are, these patients are diagnosed somewhere else and then they get referred to us for further treatment. Yes. Fortunately, at times we come to know that at baseline only total light change is done, total kappa and total lambda, but we don't yes. have the serum free light change. Yes, yes. So in these patients for response assessment is always difficult because we don't have the baseline serum free light chain assay. Yes. So it's a mathematical formula wherein we can gauge that if the total light change is so much, this much be the free light change. No, I will not recommend that because that is too crude and kind of obsolete now. So it's always better, like, you know, rather than going for on all those mathematical formula. And uh, nowadays, I think the total, rather than serum protein electrophoresis, which is giving the kappa and lambda, the most of the, lab, uh, like all the lab has shifted to the free light chain because nowadays total lambda and total kappa is not much available with the uh, different uh, like instrument vendors. So because of that, uh, but calculated, I will not recommend because it will, it, it, it is very obsolete and crude. Right. And you briefly mentioned about the IgD and IgE uh, yes. in, in your presentation. Yes. Do all uh, light chain myelomas need to undergo uh, IgD and IgE immunofixation to diagnose IgD, IgE myelomas? Not really, but suppose there is a clinical suspicion and if possible, yes, because many research facility, they go for uh, light chain myelomas uh, for this, but if there is no clinical suspicion, so because IgD and IgE antisera is not available with uh, all the lab. Most of the lab doesn't have uh, like, you know, there is one specific vendor and that also that IG, they don't actually procure or they don't give uh, the IGD and IGE and etc. So many times you ask lab to do IGD and IGE. So it's not available. If possible, yes, but it's not available only. So how to do that? So because of that, whenever there is a clinical suspicion, so to, to go for that. Otherwise, no. So that was my next question. If you don't have the immunofixation uh, for IgD and IgE, can we go by total IgD and total IgE levels as we do in IgA? Yes, yes, yes. So because that is total only. Well, I, I, uh, so they, you can go for that. So if it is elevated, then it is uh, maybe a rough surrogate yes. for an IgD, IgE myeloma. Yes, yes. Thank you. Or as for like, you know, the specific setup uh, has... IgD and IgE and T-SERA uh, in the uh, in electrophoresis, agarose gel electrophoresis, we can ask for those uh, setup, uh, this thing. But usually we can't detect IgD and IgE by uh, normal um, immunosubtraction or immunofixation. Thank you. Dr. Tushar. Good morning. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for that uh, brilliant talk. Uh, Ma'am, my, uh, uh, my question is more of a comment uh, with regards to the urine specimen which we receive um, uh, for these uh, diagnostic tests. Because, ma'am, there is a lot of variation and there is no consistent agreement between the 24-hour sample or a morning sample yep. yeah. or a random sample. So, uh, it leads to a lot of variation and pre-analytical problems. So, uh, 
ma'am what is your take on this so i would like to like i mentioned during my talk although the like, guidelines mention to go for that but it's not uh, like you know whenever is required because there are a lot of discrepancies and lot of variation like you mentioned and also the collection of the 24 hour samples is cumbersome so because of that if we don't uh, uh, suspect the benz jones protein in urine and uh, if we uh, there is no need I don't think uh, like how it is mentioned at the CDA uh, screening test because harmonization of the urine protein electrophoresis is uh, really a challenge. So I I, I don't think uh, anybody is doing that as a screening test. Okay, all right, ma'am. And my second my my second question was about the reporting pattern. So if the report is absolutely normal, should we report normal electrophoresis pattern or para protein not detected? Because in a hospital setup, uh, we get a lot of patients who are actually, the report is not normal uh, and the para protein might not be detected, but the report is not normal. Yes, we should uh, re uh, write para protein non detected rather than normal electrophoresis because normal electrophoresis is not possible, but there may be acute inflammation, so there may be something else, hemolysis maybe. So yeah. it will not be normal report. So it's better to uh, not report as a normal electrophoresis better. All right. Thank you. Uh, Siddesh. Good afternoon, ma'am, and good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Ma'am, I have two questions. One is, for how many days the sample of free light chain assay is stable? Because in peripheries, the sample rotate from uh, the primary collection center to a corporate lab, from there to their mother lab, and then it, it is reported. And that too, they have batches, like they will report on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. So uh, for how many days the free light chain, uh, assay is uh, uh, stable and what should be the ideal time in which it should be reported? And the second question is for patients who have IgG myeloma. Now, if a patient has got repeated infections, then if the IgG levels are less than 400, the recommendation is to uh, give prophylactic IVIG for these patients. So if the patient has already got a baseline IgG uh, disease, then in that case, how do we get the actual value of um, normal IgG, uh, which is secreted by normal cells? Like, uh, how do we uh, decide on prophylaxis in these patients? Understood. Uh, so first question is how many days we have checked, like, you know, uh, when I was in some reference lab, we uh, I, I checked like we used to get samples from different parts or different countries. So we checked till uh, like for, uh, how our normal schedule is like zero, uh, then 24, 72, uh, 48, 72. So we checked till five days. So there is not much variation we have seen in that study. But uh, in our, like, you know, hospital setup, this is not a challenge, but yes. For serum free light chain, we have not seen much variation because of the storage or if it is if it is stored properly in the cold chain, so there is not much variation. And second thing is, I think you mentioned about this, if, uh, if the patient is uh, to differentiate between the IgG myeloma and if there is uh, uh, is IBIG therapy, like, you know, which is the total IgG. So uh, if uh, seeing the um, immunofixation, suppose it gives, and that total immunoglobulin concentration by nephronometry or immunotabetometry will give you the uh, clue if there is a baseline. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajat. Dr. Rajat, are you there? Dr. Rajat, you want to ask a question, then you unmute yourself. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry for the whatever happened. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so I, just, uh, I just want to thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful lecture you gave. Uh, ma'am, there was just a discussion on the IgD and IgE uh, pattern in the myeloma, ma'am. 
so you said that if there is a clinical suspicion we should go we can go and test for the igd and igg myeloma so my question to everybody here is like what are the, what is the like clinical what would be the clinical suspicion suggestive of igd and ige myeloma uh, how would be uh, how would we like uh, can suspect uh, whether it was like a judge difference in light chain and versus igd and ige myeloma so can anybody and also secondly sir somebody faculty had just told that if we cannot measure igd and ig myeloma we can measure something total total levels of immunoglobulin what was that i missed that i was could somebody repeat it i hope i am very clear about my question you are clear about your question dr banali you want to uh, yes sir so the first question how clinically you can uh, like uh, the, the differentiate between the light chain uh, disease or uh, like uh, here i mentioned about like al myeloidosis or uh, uh, the clinical suspicion of myeloma so if there is this to go for that second question i can like you know immunoglobulin e total immunoglobulin e we can measure by uh, there are different methods like nephelometer is available and uh, the their immunotorbidimetry so this is uh, the uh, you can measure and third thing is uh, the wh what is our challenge this igd and ige and etc for electrophoresis most of the lab don't procure so suppose the clinicians want to do connection want to do igd and igd myeloma if there is only reporting of the light chain so is it uh, the only light chain or uh, is it uh, due to igd and ige myeloma is not available with the lab so that is the challenge so because of that i said like if there is a strong suspicion of myeloma so then we should go for the every case of igd and ige if we are reporting only light chain Okay. Uh, Ajatha, said that in IgD myeloma, there is a lot of organomegaly. Okay, sir. Hepatosplenomegaly. So okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, lymphoma like presentation. And okay, sir. App says it's a light chain myeloma. You can yes, sir. Two years ago, Blood has an article of more than 100 cases of IgD okay. myeloma. And they were discussing okay. the whole clinical profile. Uh, okay. The only other difference is that it has a poor prognosis. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. About IgE clinical picture, I'm not sure whether there is a specific clinical picture. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Sumit, you have another question? Yes. So, in in uh, addition to what Dr. Tushar Segal was asking, so uh, in the era of serum free light chain assays, which are very sensitive. Is there a role of the 24 hour urine protein electrophoresis, especially for response assessment? Because IMWG still says that in VGPR and uh, PR, the urine monogram protein should be less than 200 and less than 100. So, if the serum free light chain has completely become normal and rest all the patient responded, so is there a role of the UPEP in today's era? Sir, I think you can, uh, we go by the guidelines, like we, uh, but uh, but I don't think any, sir, you follow all those guidelines, clinical guidelines of IMWG uh, in clinical practice. Okay, so Sumit, uh, uh, it appears that the value of that is only less than 1 to 2% of patients. So you're quite right, serum free light chain assay has made that redundant. And uh, in practice, you don't do it at all. Right. And uh, in certain patients of daratumumab, uh, we don't have mass spectrometry, we don't have the dara interferon reflex assays. So we basically go by the serum free light chain assays for measuring response in these patients who are on daratumumab. Now, unfortunately, if a patient has a baseline IgG kappa disease and the free light chains are not that abnormal, so how do we go for by response assessment in these patients on daratumumab? So yes, this is challenge because of that mass pack and uh, there are uh, like even in agarose gel electrophoresis, there are special essay with uh, like, you know, only for the patients with daratumumab. So I think now in Indian lab also there will be, it will be available. 
but uh, still now we have not uh, like you know we have not gone for that but again this is the challenge we each have there is a report uh, by one of our uh, in the memorial sloan catering i can show it so there is a very much variation like many many times we are reporting igg kappa and when there is in with daratumumab or any monoclonal antibody therapy, we are reporting small IgG kappa. The lab physicians should be very much cautious of reporting IgG kappa. And also the clinician, uh, if we were, you are seeing like small IgG kappa and if there is no baseline, so be cautious about uh, the monoclonal antibody interferences. But hopefully in coming year, we all have in all the lab based on the therapy, monoclonal antibody therapy, we all, we all have the specific history. Yeah, and the last question is in patients of bioclonal myeloma, for example, I have a patient of IgA kappa and IgG kappa. So when you assess response in these patients, you will look for reduction of both the clonal immunoglobulins to come down. Because in that patient, one clone has come down, but the other clone hasn't come down much. So I don't know how to gauge him as a response. Yes, so this again a challenge for us because we actually many a times we don't get the clinical history also. And many a times there is an understanding like what you understand. We, we many a times we be, because we don't practice. So many times we don't understand that. So because of that, like I showed, uh, this is maybe wrong reporting, what I showed one case, like how I have reported the biclonal as a corrected perpendicular reporting. So uh, a few years back, so this uh, now uh, the recommendation is we should take para protein and the uh, the monoclonal protein. So uh, and we should follow the same trend. But suppose we I am taking the corrected perpendicular thing, then I should report as a corrected perpendicular. Otherwise, clinician will be in delay, dilemma. If suppose the first time I have repeat, reported para protein and monoclonal protein, and uh, or maybe two monoclonal protein like biclonal gamopathy, how we have reported. So in that case, uh, we may uh, if next time I am reporting, it will increase. So that will create a lot of confusion. So now the suggestion is better to take para protein along with the monoclonal protein. So the complete, uh, the uh, perpendicular drop rather than the corrected perpendicular. Thank you, Sumit. Uh, Dr. Jyoti Sane has put a question. Are light chain myeloma treated differently from IgD and IgE myeloma? It's a treatment related question. So Dr. Barnali, you want me to handle it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So Dr. Jyoti, essentially all myelomas are treated in the same fashion. The, it's the basis of uh, what kind of light chain and heavy chain disease it is, it makes no difference. Uh, prognostically, yes, light chain myeloma do inferiorly than uh, the intact molecule and IgD myeloma, as I just mentioned, they do badly. The only type of myeloma which is treated slightly differently in the relapse setting is those who have a fish test with 1114 positivity because venetoclax is effective over there. Otherwise, we don't have any difference in the treatment. And lastly, if there's a high risk myeloma, by definition, all those criteria, then you are probably more aggressive, use more agents, four drugs, five drugs in induction, etc. So treatment of myeloma is based on the sort of, uh, you know, smoldering myeloma, high-risk myeloma, standard-risk myeloma, and 1114. Light chain versus IgD, IgE makes no difference. So probably you are asking this question whether it is really important to dig in that hard. Yes. A light chain to go for IgD and IgE. Uh, yeah. Okay. The other question to you, Dr. Barnali, is from uh, Dr. Noor Jaha. What is the role of urine-free light chain assay? There is, uh, the, again, harmonization and standardization is uh, like, you know, the question. And uh, so I will uh, prefer always serum-free light chain rather than urine-free light chain. And uh, I can see another question, sir, about the post-transplant. Yes, you want to go ahead, go ahead. 
so post transplant al amyloidosis uh, yes there is uh, uh, lambda chain uh, because of the time constraints i was not able to give all those these things so uh, like what are the interferences and what we see in the post transplant yes lambda chain is present so because of that recommendation of for al amyloidosis is by doing in doing it quantitatively rather than uh, uh, repeating it in the immunofixation or even the subtractions uh, to uh, do it by the uh, lambda, uh, free light chain quantitation rather than doing it in the sedum protein electrophoresis or immunofixation or immunosubtraction technique. Thank you. There's one more question which has remained unanswered. Uh, it's a long question. I will read out to you from Dr. Shyam. 78 years old, creatinine 4, lambda 67, kappa 35, rest of myeloma and amyloid workup normal. Kidney biopsy was not possible because of elderly age. Now two questions. One is, how do you interpret mildly raised lambda, then kappa, in renal dysfunction? This yes. So again, again, this is the very important question. So the, the, uh, in this case, renal dysfunction, the cutoff is different. So there are several papers. So in cutoff is three, uh, around three, we say in this, and there are actually several cutoff has been given. For renal dysfunctions, The uh, what should be the cutoff? or uh, light chain. So this is uh, actually the known facts and there are several recommendations and several papers. So uh, the cutoff, cutoff, we can't use the cutoff which we use for non-renal patient. Right, so Dr. Sham, if it was kappa to lambda and the ratio is more than 3.1, then that would have been significant. Uh, his question is slightly different that lambda is more than kappa and how do you interpret it? This is because of the differential excretory power of the kidney. Normally the kappa is more than lambda because kappa is excreted less. So there's a kidney disease, it can happen that the lambda excretion is lesser than kappa and the whole ratio is distorted, altered. The second part of the question is, is it always abnormal? and require in-depth analysis. Okay, so that is applies to the same thing that if lambda to kappa is more than one, should you take it as an abnormal and require in-depth analysis? Simple answer is no, you don't have to go to the in-depth analysis. Okay. It is, a, 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 yes, you can refer to the current papers on, uh, they have given the cutoff for lambda also and cutoff for the kappa also. If you want, if uh, I can, uh, like, you know, if you mail me, I can share those papers. So they have given the different cutoffs for lambda light chain and kappa light chain, what Sir has said. So, uh, because there is not possible to go for in-depth analysis. What in-depth analysis we have to uh, either quantify or not. So cutoff is different. So cutoff, we can use those, uh, use those papers. In-depth, what it means is whether to do bone marrow, PET scan, all okay. those things. Okay, sorry. Thinking sorry. that this is a myeloma or not myeloma. No, no, I don't think this is required because the cutoff is really different. So we should go by the cutoff. Right, right. Another question has come up from Dr. Nina Verma. Ma'am, would you please show SPE graph of daratumumab and monoclonal antibody treatment? Okay. You have to go back to your presentation. This is the paper I was referring. Uh, so Dr. Lakshmi Ramanathan and all. So this is their paper from Memorial Sloan Catherine. So 
So, Dr. Meena Verma, you wanted to have a look at this. So, this is before daratumumab and this is during daratumumab. So, if you see before daratumumab IgA lambda and uh, this is the peak, this is due to daratumumab. And uh, if you see, there is another new peak, IgA kappa. So, this is due to dara. So, if we see new peak and if lab reports IgA kappa, so then we should be uh, uh, either IgG kappa or IgA kappa. So, then we should be careful if there is a new peak after starting the therapy. Yes. So, this is the recommendation. I suppose that takes care of all the questions from the chat box. In case there is any question from the faculty here. Yes, Parimal. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, good morning. Good afternoon, ma'am. Excellent talk. Ma'am, my question is whether lab should report the biclonal gamopathy in their report or not? Absolutely, yes. We should report biclonal gamopathy. Report and all as I mentioned, the, the challenge is how to report it. We should we report it by perpendicular drop or should we report it with total para protein with a, a monoclonal pro, or corrected perpendicular drop? So whatever trend lab is reporting, we should report. Like I reported with M1 spike and M2 spike because that is corrected perpendicular drop. So then I mentioned it is by corrected perpendicular drop. Suppose I take that perpendicular drop, that will be huge. That will be total, uh, this thing. So it many times, if I don't mention, is it corrected perpendicular drop or is it perpendicular drop for biclonal gamopathy? So it will create confusion to the clinician. So lab should, of course, report the biclonal gamopathy, mentioning which gating technique they are using. Ma'am, the question is whether bioclonal gamopathy is exist or it is only a lab phenomena, which may by method by which is showing these two different bands. It's like uh, I have seen two two cases of bioclonal gamopathy. So uh, till now, like uh, so, it's not lab phenomena. So this is uh, we this exists. Sir, if you uh, give your expert comments. Sorry, I was trying to read the question in the chat box. Parimal, what did you ask? Sir, I, I feel that whether bioclonal gamopathy is exist or it is only, only a lab phenomena. Uh... No, it is not a lab phenomena. There are two clones of plasma cells, one producing, say, IgG kappa and one producing IgA lambda. And uh, because there is double monoclonality, uh, a question which was earlier asked by Sumit or others, how do you define a stringent, complete response? Mm -hmm. As you know, today you are doing flow cytometry on the plasma cell to say MRD negativity, etc. So that all this discussion was probably before that era. Uh, so today you do MRO, you do the flow, you pick up whether there is no uh, uh, flow showing you that there is an MRD or not. That becomes much more sophisticated than just chasing the little clone. Your clones do have non-specificity sometimes. Even after transplants, you see those oligoclonal bands so many times. Thank you. And if there are two clones, one is large, one is very small, then the small one is probably behaving like Amgus. The larger one is probably a part of your disease. Thank you. And challenges is uh, like when we are reporting biclonal gamopathy by immunosubtraction, like Dr. Jyoti asked the question, the advantages of immunosubtraction. And so many times it may be uh, like, you know, uh, different bands. So, but if it is coexist, if uh, the migrate together, so many times we missed uh, miss one band, if it is IgA lambda or IgG um, lambda. So many times we miss one band. So in this case, immunofixation, because we see the clear band in different regions, so that become advantageous for biclonal gamopathy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Parimu. The next question is from Dr. Shruti Toshniwal. In, uh, Chronic kidney disease myeloma patients 
response assessment to therapy. How do you define complete response? So in a patient of myeloma who has renal failure, how do you define the complete response? So, uh, yes, so in this thing, uh, I think complete response is by the serum-free light chain only. But in serum-free light chain, again, the cutoff is different in chronic kidney diseases. So uh, there are a uh, recent one clinical chemistry paper where they have defined uh, like the uh, cutoff of serum free light chain in chronic kidney disease. So in that case, we can use that. that but the cutoff which we are normally using, we can't use that cutoff of involved and uninvolved and mm -hmm. also the um, cutoff of kappa, lambda, or if there is a lambda. So the, they have given the different cutoff in chronic kidney disease. So ma'am, if you can uh, like, you know, mail me. So I think I should have shared my mail, this thing. So I can share all a uh, couple of papers published in clinical chemistry and JLM. So this uh, College of American Pathologists along with AACC and ASCP, they have the current recommendation guidelines. They mention about the, about the uh, chronic renal failure patient also, what should be the cutoff and what, uh, what uh, we should use. Uh, Dr. Siddesh Kalantri has put two questions. One of them is clinical. One of them is probably for you. MRD is negative, but immunofixation electrophoresis is positive. Your take on this. I think this is after what Parimal asked and I answered that you do the MRD in the bone marrow. So now he has put a question that bone marrow plasma cell MRD is negative, but still the immunofixation is positive. So what is your take on this? You want to answer this? Sir, you can, if you can answer, <laughs> because I... Uh... Uh, you, you are quite right. This can happen because myeloma is a patchy disease. So it can happen that you have aspirated a bone marrow site where there is nothing and there's still residual myeloma somewhere. So if you are absolutely hardcore, you know, very, very disciplined person, you want everything to be negative, then maybe that immunofixation positivity is still relevant to you. But yes, you know, human being and medicine does not fall any laws. So you have these exceptional cases. They occur all around and these are difficult cases. It all depends upon how stringently you want to define these terms. Some people have even said that if there is a slight abnormality in the protein left, the patient from the overt myeloma is gone to MGUS. So if it is MGUS, then it is fine. Patient is okay. As MGUS as such, you don't treat. Probably this patient also you don't treat. It's, it's the way you look at it, I would say. Yes, and, and because of that, I think, I don't know, sir, because of that, this classification of this IMWG criteria for response, so because of that, in the response criteria, they mentioned that negative, uh, complete response, negative IFE of the serum and urine. So uh, these are basically meant for research tools. When you know you are doing drug trials, you have okay. to have definitions. So without that, you can never sort of pull data from 100 centers across the world. But in clinical practice, whatever yes. pets are putting up is everyday affair. You have difficulties. So clinical practice is very different. You pay your ticket. Yes, yes, sir. So then you don't bother about this research criteria. Right. Any more questions from people here? This was the reason only, sir. I was very scared, actually, the uh, first time and uh, uh, to present in front of this audience. Uh, so. Nothing to get scared. We learned so much from you today. Uh, it's... if I. I'm a clinician. If I am asked to address biochemist, I will run away. I won't even face you. You have faced so many clinicians today. So their queries are different. It's understandable. But you did a wonderful job. You educated all of us so immensely. We got the insight into what you are doing in the lab. And I think our care of patients will be much better now with the understanding of all this. So as there are no more questions, Dr. Barnali, thank you very much for sparing your Sunday afternoon and preparing this talk for us. It's thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It actually, 
even for me also a great learning experience so thank you so much hopefully after this i will also improve my reporting pattern much more after hearing from sir and all of you thank, thank you. you and thanks to our uh, sponsors jensen and nirvin and thanks to kalpesh and his team for managing the show and thanks to all the discussants and a large number of audience from almost 25 countries they have logged in to listen to you so thanks to all of them Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.